all of you that are here, join us with one accord together with the brothers and sisters on live stream. This is our eighth message in the series on the New Covenant, or New Testament. Those are interchangeable. Some, some versions don't use the word testament. New Testament and New Covenant, these are synonymous terms, and there's, there's ten scriptural references to New Testament or New Covenant. So you should be familiar with those. As you know, a covenant is the basis upon which God has dealings with men. Now, I want to be careful how I say this, but God's dealing with you is not because he loves you. He does love you. <laughs> but the basis is a covenant. That's the basis of God's dealing with people. Now, he established that with Noah, mm -hmm. and he established that with Abraham. Mm -hmm. The basis upon which God deals with people is a covenant. Mm -hmm. It's not a you and God mm -hmm. scenario. Yes. People have to understand it, uh -huh. because normally this is the way it's preached. It is you and God. No, it's you, covenant, Christ, God. Yeah. That's how it works. Now, this message tonight, I'm, I'm going to do my best on this, I think. <laughs> I want to make this summary statement, and I'll, I'm going to seek to prove this. That one of the chief reasons for working with this select nation is that God is demonstrating his faithfulness. As one of the main reasons he chose Israel. Mm -hmm. And our text says he's making the covenant covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. That's after they were divided. Mm -hmm. Because God is showing his faithfulness, because nobody is going to trust God and live for him that questions whether or not he's faithful. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Now, God could have just said, I am faithful, but. Man's a fallen creature. He doesn't, he doesn't grasp a, a statement like that. So God is going to prove he's faithful. Now, we've got all kind of people teaching today that God has abrogated his promises to Israel. Now, this is common teaching. I come from a background like this, and this is common teaching that the church took the place of Israel but see, that negates what God's doing. Yeah. That suggests he's not faithful, uh -huh. mm -hmm. whatever reason you may assign it. Mm -hmm. And how, are you gonna, how do you know he won't do the same thing with the church? That's right. see? We know he won't because of his faithfulness. Amen. We want to demonstrate that. Now, let's first of all establish some of the associations with the new covenant. Again, it was made, he says, I will make a covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. Jeremiah 31 says it. Hebrews 8 says it. Repeats it again. Now, this covenant is connected with the remission of sin. You really got to see this. Jesus said at this table, when he answered to this table, this took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for the remission of sin. So that's a key pillar now. Mm -hmm. The remission of sin. That's connected with this covenant. Mm -hmm. This covenant is not an agreement to help you out with whatever you need help with. Mm -hmm. That's not the covenant. He'll do this, but that's not, not, that's, that's not what the covenant is. Remission of sin. If ever anybody qualified for remission of sin, huh? It's the house of Judah and the house of Israel. What a suitable, uh, what a suitable demonstration of that. Another thing about this new covenant, the apostles were ministers of the new covenant. They, they dispensed it, they announced it, they defined it. 
2 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul says, who has also made us, the apostles, able ministers of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Now you ask yourself the question, how many ministers are ministers of the New Testament? You ask the average Christian, what is the New Testament? And you get a blank stare. They don't know. They think it's the last 27 books of the Bible. I give it a try. Just, just select some people and just ask them what. I read it about the New Testament and the New Covenant. What is it? Ask them. You can even ask some preachers if you want. Ask them. I commission you to ask them. You'll find out this is a much neglected subject. Some of them will fumble around, but uh, yeah, we're ministers of the New Testament. That, that is, they, they, bring them, they bring the covenant to the attention of the people because the covenant has to do with them, see. And the Holy Spirit, he's ministering in this New Testament. The Holy Spirit is the unseen minister. In fact, the New Covenant is called... In 2 Corinthians 3, 8, the ministration of the Spirit. And 2 Corinthians 3 is about the New Testament as compared to the Old Testament. The glory of the New Testament, the effectiveness of the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit, <laughs> He works through the Testament. Amen. Uh -huh. He's a minister of the New Testament. See? So if a person doesn't know what the Testament is, of course, they're not going to know very much about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's implementing what the Testament said. See, what the Testament is all about, the Holy Spirit is ministering that. So this is a living Testament. No such thing existed of the Old Testament. Holy Spirit wasn't a minister of the Old Testament. Me? Another thing about the Testament is it has to do with being made righteous. 2 Corinthians 3 and 9. If the ministration of condemnation, that's the law. So you've got to read, you've got to read the whole chapter and see this. The ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness. See, the, this New Testament, this new covenant has to do with making people righteous. Amen. Yeah. It's, not a, just, it's not just a cover-up technique. The New Testament is remission of sins, but it goes beyond remission of sins. Your sins are admitted so that you can be made righteous. Righteousness is not just the absence of sin. Now, a lot of people may think it is. Oh, no. Righteousness is the presence of, of God character in the person. So I'm establishing here what the, what the covenant is has to do with. In the New Covenant of the New Testament, God writes His laws, same one that were on tables of stone. Yeah. He writes His laws on people's heart and yeah. puts it yeah. in their minds. Uh -huh. All right, what does that mean? Does that mean that tonight you'll go to sleep and in the morning you'll be able to quote the book of Romans? No, that's not what it means. It means when God writes it in your heart, when he, when he does that, he's got to do this. None of us can do this. He write it in your heart, put it in your mind, and then when you hear it, you say, Amen. I, uh -huh. yeah. I can see it. See? It's got to be written in your heart and put in your mind before you know what's going on. People stumble and bumble around about the Word of God. They don't know for sure what God means, what He says. They sit in rooms and argue about why. Because it's not written in their hearts and put in their minds. Whatever they may say. Yeah. That's not been done. But in the New Covenant, that is what God does. Yeah, so wherever men don't have agreement with God, they're not even in the New Testament. Yeah. They're not even part of the New Covenant. Either that or God writes it without them knowing it, and that's inconceivable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. It can be, oh, if you're not careful, it can, it'll make you very skeptical mm -hmm. if you know this. So you've, you've got to know the camp of God's very great. It's just that we didn't, many of us weren't traveling in circles where we come in contact with these kind of people. 
Some of you went to church for years and never did know anybody who had the law of God written on their hearts and put in their minds. You talk about the word of God, you get questioning looks. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? What version are you using? Mm -hmm. they, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. But when you come from that background, which some of us did, you were greatly handicapped by that. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any confirming evidence that God ever did do what he said he was going to do. This is what I'm going to do. God this is what I'm going to do. This is my covenant. I'm going to put my laws, I'm going to write my laws in your heart. For you want them, you have an affection for them. I'm going to put them in your mind so you think about them, recognize them, and agree with them. See, That's what I'm going to do. And if that hasn't happened, either God didn't tell the truth, or you didn't tell the truth. It's one or the other. And if you don't know, you should just always say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And ask God to help me out with this. There's no such thing as a Christian who's in fundamental disagreement with God. Amen. You see, you've opened up a can of worms and you just say that. Yeah. But that's the truth. Because yeah. God said, this is what I'm going to do. This is Romans 8, chapter 10 through 12. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 6. 10, 16, and 17. I will write my laws in their heart and put them in their mind. The Hebrews 10, 16 reverses it all. I'll write them in their mind and put them in their heart. But they'll be a part of your thinking. Be a part of your thinking. You'll never question, did God mean what he said? See, you'll never... <laughs> If you say, I don't know what it means, you say, Lord, give me understanding. Give me understanding so I know what you meant here. That shows it's in your heart, see. Yes. Amen. And knowing the Lord is a critical part of the new covenant. Roman, Hebrews 8.11 is prophesied Jeremiah 31.34. He says, now... The people in this covenant, they'll all know me from the least to the greatest or the youngest to the oldest or the novice to the elder, however you want to view it. But everyone's going to know me. They're going to know when I'm talking. They're going to know when I'm not talking. They're going to know the shepherd's voice. Mm -hmm. They're going to be acquainted with me. They're going to be subjected to some things. They're going to say, that's not like God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God wouldn't do that, you see. Yeah. Well, we shouldn't be quick to judge. Well, there's some things, if you're not quick to judge, you'll just be condemned. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's some things you got to know right now. Is it from God or is it not? Huh? Mm -hmm. There's some yeah. things like this. And it's what God said. They'll all know me now. They'll all know me. They'll recognize me. Mm -hmm. We got some little children here. And they have older brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Their brothers and sisters know mama's voice. And the infants do too. Mm -hmm. They know it. Mm -hmm. They can recognize it. All God's people know him. Mm -hmm. They all do. I know this doesn't fit in with a lot of theology, but just scrap the theology. This is the way it is. Amen. I'm explaining now the covenant that he made. It's not the covenant is not is not based upon God's response to men's doing. Yeah. So that if you do well, God will say, I'll, I'll include you in the covenant because you did well. It's based upon man's response to his son Who's the embodiment of the covenant? Amen. See? Yes. In fact, Isaiah said of Jesus, the Messiah, he said, I will give you for a covenant mm -hmm. to the people. So you are as much in the new covenant as you're in Christ. You know as much about the covenant as you know about Christ. Uh -huh. See? So as the covenant is based upon man's response to God's son. Was he received? Or was he not? When people heard his words, did they do them? 
or did they not? Jesus said, now I'll tell you what a man is like that doesn't, that hears my word and doesn't do. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what he's like. This is the king now. He says, he's like a man that built his house on the sand. And the winds and the rain came, the destructive forces, and the house collapsed. He wasted his life. He wasted his time. Mm -hmm. It's important to know. Know these things. In the covenant, the children do what Jesus said. If you find people aren't doing what Jesus said, they're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I command you? How would you like to have to answer that? What would you answer to that? Would you stand before he that knows all things and say, well, I didn't understand what you meant, which would be a lie. Mm -hmm. When Jesus says something, it's pretty clear what he says. All right, now, now now let's address this question. Why is the problem, why was the covenant promised to the house of Judah and the house of Israel? This is the covenant I will make with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And the church is never called the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Unless I've missed something, never call it. Now, why is it that way? And this is, uh, this is, this is unique. God uh, goes out on and makes this very, very clear. Let me just read you some words about this. Jeremiah 32, 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them, this is right after chapter 31, where he said, well, I'm making it with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for their chil- and of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So he's talking about the covenant, the same thing. This is what I'm going to do. I know there's people say, well, he, he doesn't, he's not going to come through with that anymore. Well, this is, this is bad, bad theology. This is bad theology. To represent God is not doing what he said he was going to do. You're going to dare to represent God that way? Yeah, I'm for firing all the people that teach that. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. They're hindering people. Let's take another statement. This is Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds is of many, but as one, and to thy seed which is Christ. All right, now here he traces it back to Abraham. It says, made with Abraham. And Abraham, while some Gentile nations came from him, the Messiah didn't come from Gentile nations. Just in case you didn't know. <laughs> Israel was raised up to birth a Savior, and the promise was given, was given to them. And it was so, so, uh, what I'm establishing, what I mean to establish by this is that the effectiveness and solidity of the promise is owing to what God said to Abraham. And if he abrogates and nullifies Judah and Israel, then what he promised Abraham See, falls to the ground. Right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's because of, it's not because of Israel that they, this cover was made, but because of Abraham yeah. that it was made. Amen. Now God told Israel how he felt about them through Moses, Deuteronomy 7, 7, and 8. The Lord did not set his love upon you, set I tell you, when God sets his love, you don't want to be the one that talks about him removing it. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. Well, why did you do it, Lord? 
but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he'd sworn to your fathers. Uh It's how God feels about it. I'm keeping this oath that I swore to your fathers. Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. He redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, because of what he promised. See, what he promised Abraham. Now Jesus, for the Father, through the tri- through Israel, Judah and Israel, he cultured a man in in that nation that to be a high priest, mm-hmm. and it was a thing pertaining to God. God established in Israel mm-hmm. that the way He was going to save the world was through a through a man yeah. who was a, the official representative of the people to God and God to the people. That, that's how this thing was going to be. Worked out. It wasn't going to be person to person. It was going to be God to Jesus to people, people to Jesus to God. That's how it was going to work. So the, here's what the priest said about the high priest. Every high priest is taken from among men is ordained for things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. See, he had to he had to establish this concept that there was somebody between him and the people who offered sacrifices for the people to God mm-hmm. and who brought the blessings from God to the people. See, you know all about this. You've heard about this. But this people hadn't heard about anything like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a new thing. And so he's establishing it through Israel. He's establishing these types and figures. Now, for God to abandon them... This raises a lot of yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of questions. Yeah. And he established a, a higher order of high priest through Melchizedek. We don't know what is where he come from. We don't know anything about Melchizedek mm-hmm. other than that other than he blessed Abraham. But he was a forerunner. The scriptures call him a forerunner. Is for us entered in, entered have, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who was a priest and a king. Aaron was a priest, but he wasn't a king. David was a king, but he wasn't a priest. So the Savior has to be a ruling. Now I'm establishing why God gave the covenant through Judah and through Israel. Because all of the essential concepts, they're the ones he told them to. There's the ones he established them. There's the ones he taught the people about how he's saving people. Mm-hmm. He's saving people not just by a fiat or a word. He could create, he could just say, let there be light, and there be light. But he couldn't say, let there be a new birth, and yeah. it, it, that's not how yeah. it's done. That's right. Amen. You're dealing with personalities. Uh-huh. Yes. You're dealing with ad. In a, people in an adversarial environment, mm-hmm. and so you needed a a savior that's a king too. Yeah. Got to be over all the opposing forces so that at his word they just back off. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. Jesus never did fight with anybody when he was on earth, that's right. Amen. and he's never going to fight with anybody. Amen. Anybody. Uh-huh. Amen. Anybody. You say, well, people are going to gather on earth to fight against them. That's right. And what does the scripture say happened? They gathered together and fire came down, That's burned right. them up. So there was there was no battle. Amen. Amen. Why is it that way? Because that's the kind of person you've got to have to save you. Yes. You've Amen. got to have a savior that's over all to save you. Amen. To get you from here to God, to bring you to glory. You've got to have a savior that is absolutely and unquestionably over all. Amen. And he taught that through, uh-huh. through Israel. And he cultured a king in David that would represent the king of glory, Jesus Christ. He was a king. Who, during his reign, the kingdom of Israel expanded to its fullest extent. And it took tribute from all the surrounding enemies. That's what Jesus, Jesus moves the kingdom out from Judah and Israel, see, he moves it out to the whole world. Now, in the process of time, because of sin, 
the nation of Israel was divided. It happened because Solomon, whom a lot of people preach more about Solomon than they do about Jesus, you know. I, I, I won't listen to people like that because they haven't got all their th theological marbles. Solomon's one of the worst sinners that ever lived. In fact, God was angry with him because he appeared to him twice. He instituted idolatry. Not only married idol worship, but he instituted idolatry. He instituted worship of Baal. He instituted it. So because of that, God took the kingdom from him. Here's what he was told. He said, this is to his son, to Jeroboam, take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. I will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and Jerusalem's sake, that's Judah. And then Benjamin was added to that a little bit later. Now this, uh, so he divides, see, that's where, Ju that's where we entered into Judah and Israel. That, that's, where that, that's where that happened. I'll make a covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, and here, there's where they were divided. And to this day, they've never been united. In fact, they talk about the lost ten tribes. Nobody knows where they are. Nobody can identify them but God. But the covenants made with the house of Israel and the house of mm -hmm. Judah, and that was after they were dispersed. Mm -hmm. they, see, Israel was dispersed. The Assyrians took them captive. They were dispersed all over the world. Mm -hmm. Judah went to the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. So this promise is made after, mm -hmm. after the separation, dispersion. The first covenant was made with them, and they broke it. Israel, mm -hmm. the nation together, they broke it. Jeremiah eleven seven says, I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even to this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. See, I, to I told them. I told them over and over and over, Obey my voice. Yeah. He told them what he'd do if they didn't, and he told them what he'd do if they did. Mm -hmm. Yet, he says, they obeyed not, yeah. nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in their imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yeah. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. See? Mm -hmm. A little bit later, he's going to make a, he said, I want to make the new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And here he tells you, they both, <laughs> they both broke my covenant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Both of them broke it. Now, God has, never, um, God has never promised the Gentiles directly that they'd have a covenant. Never made any covenant with Gentiles directly. The covenant was based upon God's promise to Abraham. This is, listen, listen to Exodus 2.24. God heard their groaning. They're in Egypt, Israel, in Egypt. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So I was thinking about yeah. remembered that. Leviticus 26, 41. That I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and then and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember? I'll remember the land. See, he's, think, he's thinking about this. I'm establishing why 
God made the covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. It was because he made this promise to Abraham. That's why. 2 Kings 13, 23. The Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them, neither cast them, he them from his presence as yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember that? Psalm 105, 8 and 9. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. So he, he establishes this all along. It's not because uh, Israel has been exemplary. It's not because Judah has been faithful. It's because of what I said I'd do, yes, amen. what I amen. promised Abraham. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. God's going to find a way to do it righteously, see. Jesus' birth related to Abraham's, the promise he made to Abraham. Zechariah said this in Luke 1, 72 through 75, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. See? So Zechariah knew, he prophesied, this is why, this is why God's continuing to work with Israel and with Judah. It's not because they've done well. Mm -hmm. It's because he made a promise he's not going to go back on that promise. He made it to Abraham. And he's going to keep it because of Abraham. Because of Abraham, he's going to keep it. Now, through Ezekiel, God promised he was going to reunite Israel and Judah. See, now, to this day, they're divided. But he promised he was going to, he promised he was going to reunite. This is God speaking now. And this is at the time of the Babylonian captivity, the prophet Ezekiel. Here's what he says, Ezekiel 37, 16 through 24. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick... And write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Two sticks. Mm -hmm. Judah, mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. Now join them one to another into one stick. Mm -hmm. yeah. They shall become one in thy hand. There you are. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? What do these sticks? What do these sticks mean? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the land in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick. And they shall be one in mine hand, mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes. And say unto them, say, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in thy land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Yeah. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, mm -hmm. nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them mm -hmm. out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so they will be my people, that, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd." And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do them. Mm -hmm. Now, Amen. anyone with a modicum of education can understand that, that promise. Yeah. This is what God, this is why he's made the covenant with the house of Judah, with the house of Israel. He's going to demonstrate, he's going to demonstrate that he can be trusted. He can be trusted to do what he promises. How do you know? This is how you know. 
And the day is coming when he's the deliverer is going to come out of Zion, Paul said, and going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See? And when that happens and everybody, the Jews are one, they have one king, the Lord Jesus, and then you say, God has done what he said he was going to do. And then some people that know the Lord say, that's what he did with us too. He did what he said he was going to do, see? That's why the covenant was made uh, with them. Now, he provided a way for Gentiles to be related to Abraham. It's a technicality, but the, the others were blo his blood relation. Not all of his blood relation were included here. There is Israel within an Israel, but all of them were blood, blood relation. So God devised a way the Gentiles could be connected with Abraham because the only way they can be saved is by the promise given to Abraham. So Romans 4.16 says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end for this purpose that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, this Judah, Israel, but to those also which are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. See how impeccably exact mm -hmm. God is? Somebody had to be the basis for the Gentiles' inclusion. Mm -hmm. God never did say he was going to inaugurate a separate plan for the Gentiles Amen. and then call the church the new Israel. He, I know the scriptures speak about the Israel of God, peace be on the Israel of God, but I don't know how a person can prove that that's the church. I've never read anyone that set out to do that that did it satisfactorily. I don't know that he meant by Israel of God, he meant now the church took the place of Israel. I think he meant just exactly what he said. Knowing therefore that they would be of that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. See, that's... Mm -hmm. Now, this coincides with the doctrine of Scripture, in the book, particularly the book of Romans, chapters 9 to 11. The Gentile, believing Gentiles are grafted into right. yeah. the house of Judah and Israel. They're grafted into Amen. the Jewish olive tree. Amen. They were a wild olive yeah. tree, out in the desert, uncultured tree with withered fruit. That's what they were. They were grafted in. See, but if, if the church takes the place of Israel, now we got a dilemma here. That means you're going to have to cut down that tree. Yeah. Now, I admit, I admit that the tree was, in a sense, cut down. John the Baptist said the axe is laid to the root of the tree. That, that did happen, but we've got a, an illustration of God's working in Daniel mm -hmm. where Nebuchadnezzar was likened to a tree spread out mm -hmm. and uh, the watcher said, cut that tree down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Nebuchadnezzar lost his dominion like Solomon lost yeah. his dominion. So he cut it down, yeah. but then something happened. That stump, uh -huh. the scent of water, yes. made it bud again. Amen. All right, we admit, yeah. we admit, Israel feels like they've been cut down. We admit, but the stumps That's are going right. to grow again. Amen. Judah and Israel are going to grow together again. Uh -huh. It's going to happen, Amen. and the promise of God will be full, fulfilled. In Christ, just as surely as Judah and Israel will be joined together, just that surely Jews and Gentile are joined together, mm -hmm. and all will be one. And God will have established in the whole process, God will have, estab have established he was faithful. Yes, amen. You can count on God to do what he said he was going to do. Yes. If God said he was going to join Judah and Israel amen. together, that's what's going to happen. If God said they'd have one king, mm -hmm. that's what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. If God said the Gentiles would be grafted in, that's, that's what has happened. The reason for this all, as I 
have sought to establish is that God is faithful. Yeah. He has both Jew and Gentile created, Ephesians 2.15. Of the twain, Jew and Gentile, he created one new man. Yeah. See? We had, before we had man, Israel. Then we had a divided man, mm -hmm. Judah, man, Israel. <clears throat> That he joins Judah and Israel together, one mm -hmm. man. Then he takes the Jews, he joins them, one, and he ends up one man, all based upon one promise. Yeah. All based upon one mm -hmm. glorious promise. Amen. In Christ, just as surely as Judah and Israel will be joined together, Jews and Gentiles are joined together, and we are not... The Gentiles are never considered separate from the Jews. Uh -huh. yeah. We're part of we're a new man and part of one body. There's Amen. one body Amen. consisting of Jew uh -huh. and Gentile, based on the promises made mm -hmm. to Abraham. It's clearly stated that the promise, the covenant promise to Judah and Israel is the one Jesus is presently mediating. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1 established that, that the promise that he made to Judah and Israel, that's the covenant Jesus is presently mediating as uh -huh. Hebrews 8th chapter establishes. He's one mediator. He's the mediator of the new covenant, mm -hmm. see? Yeah. Made with Israel, with Judah. It's our, it's our faith that connects us to Abraham mm -hmm. that joins us to the remnant of Abraham's seed. Yeah. And so far as the gospel is concerned, the Gentiles are also rans. Mm -hmm. It had just been added as a blessing. Yeah. Uh -huh. God told us, son, he says, it's too, it's too small a thing to give you, just give yeah. you the Israel. Uh -huh. I'm going to give you the Gentiles yeah. too. Amen. And Jesus referred to the Gentiles. He says, other sheep, other. other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Judah, Israel, other sheep I have, and them I must bring, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. See? Mm -hmm. Why? Because of what he promised Abraham. Yeah, Why? So that we who have fled to him for refuge might have hope. Yes. Uh -huh. Amen. You've got to end up trusting in God. That, that's how you, you've got to end up trusting in God. And so God, try and conceive of that happening if he, God hadn't have done it this way. Yeah. See, God did it this way. It looked like the thing got completely out of hand. That's what it looked like. It looked like it got completely out of hand and the, and the project failed. That's what it looked like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. This, I'm God you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. This is God we're talking about. Yeah. Project didn't fail. This was all done deliberately. That's right. yeah. Deliberately to show that nothing on earth or in heaven can separate someone from the love of God that's been set upon them. Nothing can do it. Not division. Nothing can do it. God's going to prove himself faithful. Amen. I hope you got a little bit. Yes, <laughs> it, was a hard, it was a hard subject to minister on. Brother Michael has our exhortation.